that's great. I'm not under, you know, almost three feet of snow, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, the, we're, we're recording this, and I'm, I'm going to share the YouTube link later with families and volunteers and coaches who weren't able to participate. So I think you all know me. I'm Lisa, Lisa Paglis Lacroix, and I'm the founder of Love Serving Autism. And I'm super excited today to introduce you to a wonderful company, Path to Potential. And they're located in New York. And um, we, you know, I met um, one of the um, board certified behavior analysts who lives in Florida and she came to one of our tennis programs. So we're partnering now. We do hope to have a future program in New York and really work together with families and um, they do an incredible job. So I'm really thankful for their support of our adaptive tennis program. And today uh, we would like to discuss um, really how to implement um, ABA or applied behavior analysis um, across all settings and especially on the tennis court uh, for children and adults with special needs. Um, I, I see Megan's on the call here and she lives in Florida. Her son Max is in our tennis program. I do speech therapy with him as well. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think it, you'll see the PowerPoint today from, from Lauren who really um, did a great job on talking about, you know, how do we apply these um, behavior modification techniques both on and off the tennis court and it applies to humans animals I have a puppy now so you know we're using this with the puppy uh, so um, I guess Nicole you wanted to mention um, about the Q&A yes so um, if you have any questions that you um, want to ask or anything while Lauren's presenting feel free to write it in the chat um, and if she sees it, she'll answer it right away or um, just feel free to kind of wait till the end and we'll answer any questions that you might have at the end. Thank you. Excellent. Hey, Lauren, do you wanna go ahead? Um, let's see, there you go. You're gonna share your screen. Okay. So, hello everyone, my name is Lauren Rivera. Um, I am a BCBA board certified behavior analyst. I'm originally from New York, but now I live here in Florida. I live in Melbourne, Florida. And um, I'm so blessed to work with Angelina Acevedo and Jason Lantier, who are the co-founders of Path to Potential. So um, I'll let Jason and Angelina talk more about Path, Path to Potential at the end of the presentation, but we're here actually to talk about um, applied behavior analysis and its benefits in uh, recreational opportunities like tennis. So let me give you a little background about myself. So um, uh, ABA is actually my second career, but um, moving into this second career, I was a clinical director in Puerto Rico. And one of my first tasks was actually to put together a summer camp. And I got there in uh, August, 2017, and they wanted the, ca the camp up and running by June. And so I had only a couple of months to put it together. And I was so lucky because I had occupational therapists working with me, physical therapists, psychologists, that was my whole entire team. And so what we did was we got people all over the island to donate services like paddle boarding. We took our kids to uh, the beach. We took them to museums. This is a museum in San Juan. We took them paddle boarding. Our kids were rock stars. And we did all this. We were able to have them stand on a paddle board and be this successful because we had occupational therapists, physical therapists, psychologists working with them, breaking all these activities down. And it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. Uh, one other great thing about this camp that we did was it wasn't just kids with developmental disabilities. I also invited their siblings to be a part of the camp. So it was a wonderful, inclusive experience. I took them to the beach. This is awesome. This is in Luquillo. But these kids were amazing. And what the parents always said to me was, was, you know what, thank you so much. You're doing things with my kids that I couldn't do or I thought I could not do. And that's the great, that's the approach that we're trying to take with this project, right? This is the, 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 the approach that Lisa wants. We want to do things that people say they can't do, but they can do it. It's just about breaking the, the, the task down to smaller components, which is what applied behavior analysis is about. 
So the applied behavior analysis, how it's defined, the principles of behavior are applied to improve socially significant behavior. It's systematic manipulation using, uh, used to identify the variables responsible for the improvement of behavior. Basically, bringing, breaking it down, you have an antecedent, you have the behavior and you have the consequence. And we as behavior analysts were constantly manipulating the antecedents what's happening before the behavior and the consequences after the behavior in order to get the behavior that we want. So I love this over here. Um, B.F. Skinner, who is the founder of radical behaviorism, which is um, the uh, foundation of applied behavior analysis. He said this, what is love except another name for the use of positive reinforcement or vice versa? Now, reinforcement is one of the basic principles of applied behavior analysis. Remember we mentioned those consequences? Well, we have three major consequences in behavior analysis. It's reinforcement, it's punishment, and it's extinction. Uh, reinforcement, whenever we want behavior to increase, we use reinforcement. Reinforcement, so it's getting, we're giving attention, we're giving items and activities, we're breaking or taking a break or avoiding something, physical sensation like tickles, throwing a kid up in the air. This is all reinforcement. You've seen it yourselves. You try to get one of your kids to stay up, you throw them up in the air, they're like, oh, that's great. And then they want to say it again because they get thrown up in the air. Negative reinforcement. So this is really powerful in applied behavior analysis. Um, you guys all know it, but uh, I'm going to break it down in behavior analytic terms. Basically, negative reinforcement is when you um, strengthen behavior by avoiding um, a negative outcome. So, for example, this woman, this I'll explain the whole entire uh, picture to you guys. This woman gets burned, right? So we put sunscreen on her and now all of a sudden she's always putting on sunscreen when she goes to the beach right? We remove that aversive stimuli, that aversive consequence by, uh, by applying the sunscreen. Same thing, breaks. Breaks are negative reinforcement, right? So we want a kid to continue to do their homework, so we promise them a break in order, to, in order for them to continue to do their homework, and they're more likely to do their, to, to their, do their work if we promise them that break. So negative reinforcement, and we've also seen it with, um, let's say, um, uh, uh, teaching a child to uh, ask for the music to be turned off, right? So we turn off the music when they ask for the music to be turned off. It's just the removal of that negative stimuli. And so, uh, and you're increasing the behavior by removing that negative stimuli. That's reinforcing. Punishment. So we want to de when we we apply when we apply punishment, we're basically decreasing behavior. We want to decrease behavior. It's a consequence to decrease behavior. You can you've all done it before. We've scolded children, right? Um, we take away stuff. That's all punishment. I love this diagram here. So when we give someone praise, it's positive reinforcement. You see the uh, R and the plus sign. Okay. When we um, when, when we take something, right, or I'm sorry, when we um, take something away from someone, okay, response costs, okay, so let's say someone has the iPad and we take it away from them, that's negative punishment, we're taking something away. Um, when Homer gets punched, right, when someone gets scolded, we're adding some sort of stimuli there, and so that's positive punishment. And then negative reinforcement, you, you take off Homer's t-shirt because he's too hot and that's reinforcing for him, right? So you're taking something away and then that is providing some sort of reinforcement. So behavior increases with, with positive reinforcement, okay? Um, you're adding a stimuli. Behavior decreases with positive punishment. We're adding a stimuli, but behavior is decreasing. Behavior increases with negative reinforcement. We're taking away a stimuli and then the behavior increases and behavior decreases with negative punishment. We're taking away a stimuli like that, like that iPad and then the, um, the behavior decreases. This is just a quadrant to explain the difference between reinforcement, punishment and the concept of positive and negative. All too often when people hear positive and negative, they think it's something about being happy, you know, or being mean. It has nothing to do with it. It's just the concept of adding a stimuli or removing a stimuli. Um, I'm just gonna admit someone to. Okay, so now we get into extinction. Now, 
Behavior analysts don't like to use punishment. I'm just gonna give you the inside scoop. We don't like to use punishment. We like to use reinforcement and extinction. Those are our magic tools. So extinction is a procedure where we use to reduce a behavior. The reinforcer, the re, excuse me, the reinforcer that previously maintained that behavior is removed entirely. So let's say you go to the store and, um, or yeah, so a good example. Let's say you go to the store and the child is tantruming for candy, right? And the child gets the candy for, tan you know, after he tantrums. So then the child knows to whenever he tantrums, he's going to get candy. But we don't want that child to always tantrum and get candy. So we, the next time we go to the store, the child tantrums and tantrums and tantrums, we don't give him candy. Finally, that tantrums, he stops tantruming because he knows he's not going to get the reinforcer for tantruming. And then finally, as applied behavior analysts, we want to take that behavior that we're removing, right, that, that's on extinction, and then we want to replace it with functional behavior like asking for candy. So, oops, sorry, it's not advancing forward. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Let me just stop sharing for a second. Was it advancing forward? My apologies. Just give me one quick second. We're going to go to the original PowerPoint. We might have to do it this way, guys. I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, so why is this an example of extinction? Can anybody tell me? Uh, because you're in the fresh produce area. So you're not even prompting them to ask for candy, but they maybe learn how to ask for something helpful. Good. Yeah. So she's in the produce area. They're, they're not around the candy, but she's letting them cry. She's not giving them anything, right? She's going to let them cry. Cry it out. And once they cry and they realize they're not going to get anything for crying, then she's going to teach them how to appropriately ask for whatever they want. Good job. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to go into um, basically a quick review again of what we just talked about. Okay, so you have behavior, and whenever we want to increase desirable behavior, we use positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Whenever we want to decrease undesirable behavior, we use extinction and punishment. Okay, so now moving on to some different procedures that you can use. And let me just also um, emphasize and, re, um, and underscore that basically we're presenting all these different procedures because all too often when you know people say, hey, you know, like let's teach a kid how to play tennis or let's go here and we're gonna teach a kid how to play checkers or chess and so forth. You can do all that. But sometimes with our kids, we have to break things down to smaller concepts, smaller um, uh, skills. And then we're using reinforcement, punishment, or extinction in order to get the behaviors that we want. So that's what basically I want to do here. I'm going to give you the principles of behavior in order to utilize when teaching. So a procedure that we like to use when teaching is behavioral skills training. And this is something that the coaches can use on the court. They're basically telling the child what they want them to do. They're showing the child what they want them to do. Then they do it, they're modeling it, right? The child is doing it, and then they're giving them feedback while they do it, and then they repeat that. All the magic happens in the showing and the doing. The showing is prompting and the doing is prompting as well. And we just keep going back and forth between showing and doing. And we use um, reinforcement in order to increase those behaviors. So 
over here, we have also a concept called errorless learning. This is also working with that whole entire behavioral skills training. We use errorless learning. We want to prompt from the beginning. You're teaching so the child is prompted at the onset of instruction. The child does not have a chance to make errors. They get access to reinforcement. Why are they getting access to reinforcement immediately? Because we want those behaviors to what? Increase. Always start with errorless learning. No matter what, always start with errorless learning. <laughs> All the time. They're like, he can do it. I know he can. Doesn't matter. Start with errorless learning so that they can access reinforcement. And you guys know that. You guys go through that, right? You love it when like you get helped along and then they're like, great job. That's amazing. You feel amazingly supported, right? You feel as if it's a safe environment. You want to increase your, you want to, you want to stay in that activity. You want to keep going. Okay. What is a prompt? A prompt is an extra stimulus that is used to evoke a behavior so that it can be reinforced. We love to use simultaneous prompting. Prompts that are given at the same time as the instruction, okay? Um, simultaneous prompts, we use simultaneous prompts during acquisition. This is called errorless learning. So it's all the same thing over and over again. Errorless learning, simultaneous prompting. Simultaneous prompting is errorless learning. So it's constantly the same thing. Now, once they've acquired the skill, right? Once you've, like, you've hit the point where they're answering, you know, in a, they're steady responding, we want to start to delay the prompting, right? Lisa spoke about this. She's like, you know, I just want people to know when to delay the prompting. Well, you start to delay the prompting when you see that steady responding and you're like, okay, they don't need so much prompting anymore. So I'm going to allow them to try to answer independently. Prompts that are given at the, so delayed prompting are prompts that are given sometime after the instruction. So I'm not just like doing hands over hand to like, you know, hit the ball. Now I'm going to wait maybe a second or two before I go in and prompt. I might wait five seconds before I go in and prompt. I might wait 10 seconds before I go in and prompt. That's prompt fading. This mm. is usually used to test acquisition and is used uh, further along in the acquisition process, moving towards mastery. Mm -hmm. different kinds of prompts okay so in tennis we're gonna you're gonna have the physical prompts okay you're gonna use that a lot hands over hands gestural prompts okay what are we doing now guys gesture right we're hitting the ball gestural prompt as opposed to me saying it textual prompts you might use words written down verbal prompts okay guys hit the ball Hit the ball. Instructions are, are verbal prompts. Modeling. They might watch the coach hit the ball and then you ask them to do that. You might ask them questions. Hey guys, what are we supposed to be doing right now? Hitting the ball. Okay. Most to least prompting. So again, we're thinking about the different processes of learning, right? So we start with acquisition. And we're going to use the most, uh, most intrusive prompts during acquisition. We're going to do hands over hand. But then we're going to fade out. That's called most to least prompting. You go from most intrusive to least intrus intrusive. This is used during acquisition, moving towards mastery. Least to most prompting. This is when you go from the least intrusive prompt to the most intrusive prompt. So this is used for error correction, okay? So when someone has given you the wrong answer or doing the wrong uh, uh, behavior, right? We're gonna, start, we're gonna try to like go in and like, like give them the clues, right? To get it right. And then if they're still not getting it right, we're gonna go in with a more intrusive prompt trying to have them get it right so that they can acquire or access that reinforcer. What you want to do is you want to, if you have to prompt, right, if you have to do uh, errorless learn or your, your, your error correction, and you're going from least intrusive to most intrusive, once you get that independent response, we want to fade out again. Okay, so you're constantly, it's learning, learning is, is, is always a process. It's never like straight and narrow, right? So you go from uh, most intrusive to least intrusive, 
Then with error correction, you start to move back to a more intrusive prompt. And then eventually you wanna fade out again so they're an answering independently. Lauren? Yes. Lisa, so in tennis, you know, most I usually do the least to most intrusive because I feel, and I, I don't know if it's accurate, but I feel like we always want to assume competency until we know what their skill level is, especially for a child who's maybe, you know, never played before, or he may, he may be um, able to independently hit the ball. You know, we don't want to initially, in my eyes, you know, I know it's errorless learning is important, but, you know, how do we work on that? If, if they don't need the full physical prompt and get hit a volley, they can independently do it themselves already. So you can give them a chance to independently respond, right? You could take a probe. So okay. you're like, hey, let's see how you do. And so you can kind of gauge, I would give them maybe three opportunities. And then you as that coach can kind of gauge like where they are and then prompt at that level. You don't want to give them too, like if they struggle, you don't want them not to be successful. Does that make sense? Yes. And then mm -hmm. that's the error that we make all too often. We're like, come on, you could do it after like 10 tries. I'm like, no, like, let's not do that to the child. Okay. So now let's talk about differential reinforcement. Um, differential reinforcement is uh, when you change the magnitude of reinforcement in accordance with the type of answer. So an independent answer, get, uh, independent correct responses get higher magnitude in relation to responses that need prompting, right? But that's, we have to take that into, it's like, so think about it. Like, so if they're in the process of acquisition, we're going to like do a cartwheel. If this kid has never like ever been on the tennis court and they're just there and they like the first time that they got there, they tantrumed, right? And this is the second time that they're, and you had to do hands over hand and they're just there and they they hit the ball. We're going to do a cartwheel for them, right? Because they're there, they're participating and that's great. Once they've been there a couple of times, we're gonna start to fade out and we're only gonna like do the cartwheel when they, they're giving us their best response. Does that make sense? Because we wanna shape behavior. You use differential reinforcement to shape behavior. Just the next slide. It's gradually changing what the behavior looks like by reinforcing successive approximations to the correct response. And you can do, I'll use a simple example of that. So let's say we were teaching a child and this is not a tennis example, but this is just like an easy example to conceptualize. So we wanna teach a child to say water, right? So the first time like, we're like, okay, we just want them to say wah. Wow, you said wah, we give them the water. That's amazing. Then we get them to say what. Wow, that's amazing. We don't reinforce wah because we know that they can say what. Then we get them to right. say, hello? Then we get to them to say water. Once they say water, we're not reinforcing what, we're reinforcing water, okay? Um, Preference assessments. So remember we talked about consequences. Consequences, we, we okay. talked about reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement is we have positive reinforcers and negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is giving, you know, like it's that, it's that praise, it's that um, access to the iPad, it's the uh, tickles, okay? So we want to do preference assessments because not every kid likes a tickle. Not every kid likes the iPad. Not every kid likes to be thrown up in the air and not every kid likes positive praise. So we want to do preference assessments to figure out what's reinforcing to a child. Why? Because that reinforcer is critical to increasing behavior. And if you don't have the right reinforcer, you're not going to increase behavior. So we like to ask questions, right? What are we working for today? What will motivate the learner to learn? Do they want a break? That's that negative reinforcement. Do they want to sit down on a bench? When I was working with Lisa that one day that I went to visit, the kids were working for sitting on a bench. That's what they wanted that day. That was awesome. Uh, are they working for access to the iPhone? And we've spoken about negative reinforcement. Um, negative reinforcement, I, I have to tell you, I feel like it's the most powerful. <laughs> you know, uh, negative reinforcement is that break that every kid's always working for, right? 
And so we, you want to plan for these breaks, okay? You want to plan in accordance with what the child want, uh, is, uh, uh, what they can tolerate, okay? So you don't want to go too long with a session, right? If you think that a child can last for 10 minutes without having a tantrum, without negative behavior, then promise them that that break after the end of 10 minutes. You don't want to give a break after the behaviors. You want to plan for that break prior to that negative behavior. Um, have visuals ready necessary for breaks. So you can even have like a break card. They're like, okay, like you, see, you start to see them getting itchy. Do you want a break? Ask for a break. Okay, you can have a break, go ahead. Uh, set a timer. We talked about that 10 minutes. Hey guys, we're gonna get a break after 10 minutes. I'm setting my timer now. And then the concept of first then. First we're, we're, first, we're gonna do, you know, 10 volleys and then we get a break. Escape is your friend, but don't use it after they've had, you know, negative behaviors. You wanna give, you wanna have them work for escape. That's that negative reinforcer. Physical breaks. I'm gonna tell you that this totally works. I do dance breaks all the time with my clients. They mm -hmm. love it. Kids love to run around. They love jumping jacks. They love physical breaks. So use them to your advantage. You know, guys, in 10 minutes, we're gonna have a dance break and there are tons of dance videos on the internet. The pre-MAC principle. You guys all know this, okay? It's basically um, the first then the grandma principle, okay? So you're having the child um, engage in a less preferred task contingent, or let me start that. The highly preferred task is contingent on the less preferred task, right? So you get access to um, jumping jacks. Jumping jacks is still, you know, it's a highly preferred task. They want to do that. That's, that's a physical activity that they want to do. But first they have to hit three volleys, which is the mm -hmm. less preferred activity. Okay, mm -hmm. so first we're gonna hit three volleys, then you guys get to do jumping jacks. First, we get, to, first you're gonna do, let me use an even clearer example. First, you're gonna do 10 math problems, then you get your iPad, first then. Mm -hmm. And then you have here this uh, wonderful um, uh, slide. I think it's a banner now that Lisa's created that you have, first we're gonna do tennis and then she can put up one of the many reinforcers that they're using in um, uh, during the session. So they could be using an iPad, a video game, um, access to the park, maybe it's lunch, snack, a break. Toy, uh, toys, park, um, possibly even going home. Okay, first we're gonna do this and then you get to go home. Uh, you might use that at the end of the session. Uh, token economy, token boards are amazing. I love them. Um, basically the token economy is it's basically taking, you're taking a general, generalized reinforcer. I hate to use these behavior analytic terms, but basically you're taking something that's like something, you're taking something like a, like a token, right? It doesn't have a lot of meaning to it. You're having, they're working for checks. They're working for like a penny or whatever. You're taking a token. They work for a certain amount of tokens and then they get access to the highly preferred activity or reinforcer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Schedules. Kids work so wonderfully with schedules. We all do, right? Like I have a schedule mm -hmm. every day. So for these sessions that may be an hour, first we're going to come in, we're going to greet, then we're going to do uh, character development, then we're going to stretch, the warm up, water break, uh, hand eye drills, water breaks, uh, stroke production, group cheer, and then tennis updates. That's a long schedule. Maybe it's a schedule with like four or five things, right? But we're, we want to like create schedules for them because when they create schedules then you could check it off, right? You could check it off. You could even use a schedule like a token economy. Okay, first we're going to do the greeting. Everyone does a nice greeting. Okay, great. Now we're going to move on to character development. Oh, excellent job. Everyone did such a good job. Now we're going to stretch. Great job. Those three things are checked off. You guys get a five minute break. Then you can go into the warm up whatever, but schedules are wonderful. Okay, um, I love this. Teamwork, sportsmanship, respect, listen, effort, responsibility. 
This is the character development traits that Lisa put together this beautiful visual for um, the whole entire group. And you have so many different ways that you can use this. Um, you can have it up, you can have the kids explain what teamwork is, sportsmanship, you can have them act it out. I worked in a social skills program and we, 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 we had them like role play. What is teamwork? What does sportsmanship look like? What does respect look like? Kids love things like that, especially like, and that's something that you're working on within these tennis sessions, you know, social skills. Um, so I love this, I love this uh, visual. And Lisa, you did such a great job. I love these things. So um, you can even go into uh, emotions and having them label their emotions and even acting out emotions. And then if you see a kiddo, like, you know, they're like, they have some look on the face that they're anxious. You can have them go over and say, hey, what are you feeling? Choose a picture. Okay, so you're feeling terrified right now. So like, what can we do right now so that you're not feeling terrified? What's making you feel terrified? Oh, thank you for letting me know. Thank you for explaining to me what, what's making you feel terrified right now. And so those are, that's a great, um, I love these, these visuals. It's a great way to get into uh, communicating with um, our kiddos. So that gets into functional communication training. So basically functional communication training, we kind of went into this already with the extension um, uh, explanation. But basically you're teaching appropriate communication to replace problem behavior, right? And then you're going to reinforce appropriate communication. So when a kiddo says to you, hey, you know, um, I want a break. Thanks for letting me know. That's amazing. You know what? hit one more volley and then you get a break. Great job. Okay, so we're, we're using that differential reinforcement to reinforce appropriate communication. Um, I love this as well. You can use pic uh, pictures or we call them pecs to get kiddos to let us know, okay, like, uh, are, is it okay if we wait three minutes before we take a break? Yes, okay, good job. No, what? okay, well, you know what? Yes, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, um, you know, you can get them to, to use uh, visuals to answer. And like, that's the thing is we want them to, to use communication, appropriate communication in order to communicate with us, right? That's ultimately like, you know, I love the conversations that Lisa and I have had because ultimately, you know, life is one big laboratory, right? And we're at one big classroom and we're just constantly teaching our kids how to communicate, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's one-to-one -one in an ABA session, whether it's on the tennis court, we're just teaching appropriate communication, appropriate social skills, appropriate behavior, socially significant behavior. Um, jumping, throwing, I'm gonna have to minimize this, waiting, Stop, sit, water. Again, using PECs, appropriate communication, uh, functional communication training. Um, these are other great visuals, iPad, forehand, pick up the tennis balls, serve, volley, swing. Uh, Lisa, you've done such a great job at um, all these visuals. They're just beautiful. Arm circles. Uh, I was gonna say that, you know, what I see and, and I know, you know, many of our students are nonverbal. Um, not all, but you know, we do have uh, quite a percentage on the tennis court. So I think that the visuals really make a difference and they may not be able to verbalize, I need a break, but at least they have a visual, you know, to use a gesture to point to, I need a break. Um, you know, so it's important that we remind ourselves that, you know, not all of these children have functional communication skills at that level um, to be fully conversational. And, and we want to, like you said, decrease the frustration on the tennis court for them. Exactly. And I think that you mentioned that you made banners out of this, right? Did you make banners out of this? All, actually, all the visuals, it's a long banner now. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. And so that's like something that like, it's great. Like, Again, going back to functional communication training, functional communication training is not like a whole entire sentence. Sometimes functional communication training is going over and saying, like picking the stop sign. Stop, you know, as opposed to hitting you or running away. So the easy takeaways, um, I do, we do, you do. And 
I'm telling you, the, 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 the learning happens between we do and you do, okay? We're gonna have prompting, we're, we're prompting and we do, and you do is where it's independent. Tell, show, do. And um, this is just an example. So today we're gonna learn how to volley. I'm gonna show you how to volley. I'm gonna help you, um, but then you're going to do it on your own. That's where the prompting's happening. And then you're gonna repeat this all until they do it independently. Finally, um, you know, parents, you guys all, you guys are all superheroes. You know what I mean? Everyone in this whole entire game, our kiddos are superheroes. They're all superheroes. We're all making this work together. And I like to share this quote and I'm sure um, you've heard this before, but this is one of my favorite quotes. It's actually my father shared this with me when I was younger and it's always stayed with me and I've used it in every single uh, aspect of my life. Uh, the man in the arena. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails at least, fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So I just wanna thank you all for your time today. And this is my contact information along with Angelina Acevedo and Jason Lantier. And, um, you know, we're here to support you. We're really looking forward to this partnership. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any one of us. We'd love to support you. And if we don't have the answer immediately, we're definitely willing to go and look it up. But um, we're here as a resource for you all. We're here to disseminate applied behavior analysis that we believe so much in it. And we wanna support you all in everything that you do. Thank you, Lauren, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I usually have a lot to say, but I didn't. So, cause I wanted to take it and Lisa knows that. I wanted to take everything in. Um, I have a master's in it. I'm in a whole other program. Um, it's not about my uh, life history. I, I love everything that you have to say. I'm currently in the healthcare field. I'm at a pediatric house. I mean, what you shared would be amazing. Anyone, um, as far as being able to, you know, teaching socially significant communication skills, how this is important for every child, now whether they have a challenge or not, to help them become. Uh, and like I said, I spent 15 plus years teaching and I love how we model and support. I studied this to help them learn the right behavior. Then we don't leave them by themselves. And then eventually, so they can be on their own rather than I can only do this with Lisa or I can only do this with Tyler. Um, but you give a lot of room, all the scaffolding, all this stuff. Um, so kit. And I hadn't even ever thought about that airless learning. We live in a society where it has to be perfect yesterday. And um, I think kids that whether they can verbalize it or not, they somehow feel like they have to be perfect because they have other challenges rather than we're not saying that at all. And I would love it. And this is then I'll be done. Like going forward with the partnership, like doing what you just did in the live format for the instructors, because I know that a lot of them are going to be like, oh my gosh, you know, do I do more? Do I do less? When do I extinct? When any of that? So bringing, you know, um, your, because I think we can show people just like we want to show our kids. I think our instructors need to see and feel and hear that too. So then they're gonna model that to their classes and their families. And then it's gonna look like they, they knew how to do this all along. 
which then that will much more easily transfer to our kids and our families because you never know who you're catching. You may be catching the child in your class or you're catching the family, the mom or the dad or this, oh, that would really work, which is the whole reason. I, I mean, I love this is about tennis, but the clinical piece that we're training kids how to become whole human beings because they already are. They're just learning how to communicate with us and we're learning how to communicate with them. So kudos, kudos, kudos. I love it. So I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Laura's uh, our future um, pencil. Oh, she's on our board of directors and she will um, be the future. We're going to open a program in Pennsylvania. So uh, Laura's uh, going above and beyond to help us with that. And we're excited, um, you know, about that possibility. So um, I wanted to, Megan, did you have any questions? I know um, with Max, I've known him, I don't know how many years now. <laughs> About five years. Five no, years. I mean, you know, Max, my son is um, 11. He's nonverbal. Um, but, you know, as everyone here knows, he's always communicating, but through behaviors, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I just was on um, a Zoom call with his school BCBA because we're doing virtual learning and, um, you know, we have some behaviors. Well, Lisa knows too. And one that's not great during a, a viral pandemic, which is spitting. <laughs> so um, everything that Lauren just talked about, you know, um, you know, we addressed in the call today. So yeah, I live it, you know, and we've been doing ABA therapy since he was two off and on in home and at, you know, center. So um, it is always great to review because, you know, sometimes you just get you know, so caught up in the moment, you kind of forget the guidelines and you're reinforcing the behavior without realizing that you're reinforcing the behavior. And so as a family, you know, we all have to kind of regroup, come together and, um, you know, go over the basics that Lauren was, you know, just outlining um, to change the behavior. So, yeah, I mean, it's great. And I do like, you know, a lot of the tennis because, you know, it's just reflecting back, you know, the times that, you know, Max has been there and, and as you know, tears, because he's been asked to participate um, with him. It's a lot of hand over hand in an activity like tennis at first, but, you know, he made some steps. So I think it's great. And, you know, for the volunteers that are going to be new to, you know, love serving autism, um, I think it's, you know, it's so helpful, you know, to help them work with the kiddos. Definitely. Thank you. Kyle, did you have a question about extinction? I think I saw something. Hi, Lauren, great presentation. I do have to admit I am the uh, least experienced one on here when it comes to all of this stuff. So I am by far the dumbest person in the room right now. But uh, one of your earlier slides, you mentioned about extinction. And I think a lot of people, when they think of extinction, they think of the picture that you had with it, which was the dinosaurs and getting rid of all that stuff. But with extinction also comes the ability to adapt. And as we know, it's not the biggest, strongest, fastest, smartest animal that survives. It's the one most willing to adapt. So um, I have two questions for you. And that is, how do you deal with a, a student or child that is adaptable. Um, I know you, you had the, the slide of the child uh, in the produce section. Well, what happens if, okay, they're not in the candy section, but now let's say you take them down the potato chip junk food section, or you take them down the dessert aisle or something like that. So they're gonna keep finding a way to, to, to try to get that stimuli. My second question is what do you do about extinction burst? What happens when they're going well for a while and then all of a sudden something happens, maybe they eat a candy bar, they, they, get, uh, they get upset, they get emotional and then they stop the diet. So how do you deal with those two things? That's two great questions. Okay, so let me just clarify there. So I'm gonna start with the extinction burst, okay? Cause that will lead to the other question that we're gonna go back. So the extinction burst is, let me just clarify. So let's say I'm withholding the, the maintaining reinforcer, right? And so I'm doing everything 
to get what I want, right? So I'm going to go crazy. That's the extinction burst, right? I'm going to go crazy because you're not giving me what I want. Then finally, when I give you some sort of appropriate response, then I'm going to reinforce that and I'm going to shake that up. That's the extinction burst, okay? Now, let's say the, 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 the maladaptive or the inappropriate behavior, it's under control, right? We're in extinction, extinction works. We're teaching all this appropriate behavior. We haven't seen that, that tantrum in a while. When it comes back, that's resurgence. So it comes back. So you just handle it the way you handled it in the beginning. You put it on extinction again. Now, the next thing is, Going back to the kiddo that's like not in the candy aisle, you're going to like, you know, some other aisle. You just, again, you're not giving in. That's extinction. And the problem with extinction and why it doesn't work all the time is because people give in. They're like, oh, you know, they're in a store. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> like, no, you know, like, and like, that's the problem. That's the, that's the issue, right? Or grandma gives in, but mom and dad don't. So then it's, it's, it's someone's maintaining it. True extinction is true with withdrawal of that reinforcer. And uh, Lauren, I think too, and that's I trying to think of my question as when you were talking about all this, that can be a challenge. I have taught um, like mainstream kids and I'm sure that I, I mean, uh, kids that are may have not been diagnosed on the spectrum, but I've always had, you know, kids at very different levels so that scenario everything you know you've shared is one-on-one -on -one. that can be cha more challenging I know we're going to have volunteers with the student but you know you can have kids that are in extinction and then all of a sudden someone gets out of that and that can just I mean you could have a volcano erupt in your class how is what is a good way to um, combat that? Do we just do like a big switch and do an escape and kind of reset the, the mood or what's the best way to handle that? So we're not, I don't want to reinforce like whenever, whenever something, you know, I guess a behavior comes back that's unwanted, then that, then we're reinforcing that behavior to always, I guess, take a break, do an escape and not do what we're supposed to do. That's a really good question. So like the, the issue that we have with extinction is that, you know, extinction is hard to do in a group setting, right? Like I would never say like, hey, teacher, like I want you to practice extinction and you have like 30 kids that you need to worry, like to, to, to maintain, right? I would never do that. And so you would choose an alternative procedure as opposed to extinction, I think in a group scenario. So like for one of the things, like we're in tennis bays and different things like that. So sometimes the child's, I mean, they can react to anything. I mean, that's the whole part of children being on the spectrum. You don't know what's going to set them off. And obviously, you know, day one with the child is going to be way different than day, you know, like we were on our last week of the clinic or something like that. But, you know, a child who all of a sudden just the lights are bothering them, like, you know, getting because they're super sensitive to light um, and starts having a melt, you know, how to, I guess, redirecting the rest of the class because the rest of the class is doing well. So you don't want, I mean, trying to avoid that whole domino effect where, you know, because some other kids are going to react or maybe that's something they used to do. So, you know, just maybe some recommendations on how to handle that. So I don't that's have a domino effect. Yeah, that's a really good point. So that's like, first, so that would be a, a sensory stimuli that is reversive, right? And so with something like mm -hmm. that, one thing that you can do is, first of all, identify the precursors before, like, right. they, like you know, so what are the precursors? If you see the child starting to flicker, right? Like we've seen it with kids that mm -hmm. like when mm -hmm. they start, their eyes start to flicker, oh, like, hey, Bob, are you having, a, do you want to, do you want to take a break? Do you want to go to the other room? Are the, are, the, are the lights bothering you? Okay, cool. Get them out right away. Like, right. Hands right prior to the behaviors right so what i was thinking too before like if we were going to start a clinic and i'm sorry i cut you off is no, no, like no. doing the um so giving the family like uh to fill out like what are their super sensitives you know i don't know do those change can those change on the environment but just get a general like let what are your child's top five and they can work with the parent the top five super sensors and then the also is um I forget what the other thing is, um, but that was one of, and you know, or things that 
what are things that they, what are their rewards? Like you said, take a break or get water. What are the things that help calm them down? Or Yes, you know, like do like some sort of intake before you or have the parents fill out some sort of survey, right? Like, let, let me know what are like, what are the triggers for your child? Right, that's it. You know, what, what have been triggers in the past? When was the last time they had a meltdown? Hmm. Right. You know, has it been a year? Okay, cool. Like, okay, well, I'm in good ground. Or, oh, it was last week? Okay. You know, like, and then what, what triggered it? Give me the exact scenario. What are the reinforcers? I remember, I'm going to share a story with you, is that I had one kiddo when I first started this camp. It was my first day of camp. And I didn't know this kid had an elopement issue. Mom didn't tell me. That would, I would have appreciated that. And the kid actually ended up eloping to the beach and swimming out all the way to the buoys where I had to go and swim after him and get him. So that would have been a nice piece of information. So just like, you know, like you need as much information from the parents as possible. I have a question too. Thank you, Laura. That was a great um, question. So what if a child is new to tennis or it's a second class or he's not getting out of the car to go to tennis and he's just crying, screaming, crying, screaming. I mean, do you make, do you, do you wait, wait it out? Like if you take him home, you know, I know it's tough for the parents. Go ahead. I would do a tolerance hierarchy, right? Just get him out of the car. Well, you got out of the car. You can hang out in the parking lot the first day. That's it. Then, okay, you know, you don't have to go on the tennis court, you know, just like go up to the gate. Awesome, you went to the gate, that's cool. And then have like maybe like a coach or someone hang out with him and you watch the kids. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, the third session, he's just on the tennis court. That's awesome, you don't have to do anything, just watch. You know? So what do you think? So what do you think about having like, so let's just say like, uh, I don't know, just we're, we're going to set up a clinic, I'd like a hypothetical clinics in a couple of weeks, you know, you finally get, okay, it's going to be these five families. I mean, maybe it makes sense to do some kind of, I know, uh, like a zoom call and kind of talk about all of those things because, you know, probably Lisa, the, the child even getting there, like in the car, I mean, the family may start seeing anxious behaviors the night before the day. I mean, they're not communicating it, but they know tomorrow is tennis or, you know, things like that. So like having that, um, you know, all these discussions like on a zoo and then maybe they can bring it first day, like having, you know, first day, you know, let's, you know, so bring your child's five, um, you know, super sensitives or five triggers. And what are the five things that help reward them? What are some of those pre, like uh, anxiety stuff. And then, so we can give them the parents and the family's tools to help them be successful. Right, that's a great idea. Oh, right, sorry. and like Megan and I, we experienced that with her son, right? Because a couple, uh, Megan, I think you're on mute, but a couple of um, times, you know, we had a special event and we invited Max and, you know, sometimes he would go in and then other times it was a transition of, you know, getting him into the class or the event and, it's it's tough to see you know when he's crying or upset <laughs> I get that you know but and they're amazing Megan's an amazing mom and her husband too you know but it's like so now they're starting the I don't know if Megan you want to mention uh, real quick the uh, equine therapy and Max is now starting to oh need, yeah need a, go ahead well we've always wanted to try different things with Max and so this was a great opportunity a friend of Lisa's is in the process of getting certified to do horse therapy. And, um, you know, I know Max, you know, as Lauren had said, you've got to break down learning tasks into super small steps. And with Max, you know, a horse is a huge animal. It's very overwhelming to be in their presence. So I just thought this is a great opportunity with Lisa's friend, Nicole, where we were going tomorrow. We just go for 15 or 20 minute visits every Saturday afternoon just to see the horse. I have no expectations. I don't expect him to touch the horse. Just to be around Willow and Gavin, the two horses, and in their environment. And that's where she'll eventually, you know, have her, her therapy courses. And so that's what we, you know, hope to do once a week. And then I'm hoping maybe, you know, I can encourage Max to offer a carrot stick to the horse where, you know, he's engaging, but he's still not touching. And I know Max, it's going to take 
a long warm up period. And like Lisa said, I remember, <laughs> I think I remember the one time I was out of town, I was visiting my oh. dad. He was not doing well health wise. And you had an event at the Wellington Tennis Center. And so my husband, you know, got Max over there and could not get him out of the car. Went in and got Lisa thinking, oh, if he sees Lisa, he'll get out of the car. Tears erupted. He wouldn't have done that for me, but I handle things differently than dad handles. Um, and so it just unfortunately ended up that dad got back in the car and they just drove away and Max got what he wanted, you know? Yeah, he got the reinforcement that he wanted. He got the reinforcement, but you know, Robert is, those public scenes terrify my again? husband. Yeah, 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 cause he got I mean, and that's what I like about this whole, the my, everything that you shared about, you know, ABA and how we can really help kids. Cause I mean, whether it's on a horse, when I taught special, ed, we actually had uh, an equine program that with the special ed kids and the kids during the week or when we, they would, they would have to kind of like work towards it and earn, I mean, like, and that was a constant reminder of, because they actually had a great time with the, horse, you know, um, animals and pet therapy and all things like that. So that was very, um, you know, very, very helpful. Um, so I don't know what I, I lost. I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. I just think that, um, overall this whole program can help kids really just learn how to, um, become strong, independent individuals. And, um, so I'm excited. Oh, thank you so much. I just want to share one more idea with you guys because you were talking about kids crying in the car. Perhaps if you show them videos prior to going to the session, like, hey, just like fun videos of kids having fun during a tennis class, you know, like, like how tennis can be fun. And then you can do some sort of response simulation in the house, maybe a week or two prior to the actual tennis session. We're like, hey, let's pretend we're at tennis session. I'm going to be Lisa. You're going to be you. And, you know, you just like act it out. You know, or even acting out, getting in the car and getting out. Like, okay, so let's pretend that we're like pulling up to the to the tennis um, center. And like, how are we going to, how are we going to behave? Okay, let's practice getting out of the car. You know, and let's practice saying hi to our friends. You did remind me what I wanted to say. I putting these types of resources, just everything that you said and being able to give that back to families because they're like, you want my, my son or my daughter to do what? I have a hard time taking them to X or doing different things. So giving them the support to know that we're here to support them and that they that they and their child are going to be able to become successful. Cause you know, I'm sure a lot of people don't want to sign on to something unless they think it's going to work out perfectly. So rather than giving them the tools that, Hey, this is, this is errorless learning. We're just happy that we're looking at trying to make change. And I guess we, sometimes I feel like we need to break it down for the families too. And then they can help it much more um, readily with their, um, with their children. If they're new to all of this, not someone who's seasoned. Right. I was going to say maybe um, if LSA can have like a social story yeah, made to hand out, and it could be just like a sim slim little pamphlet. It doesn't have to be anything big. So you have the visual aids and, you know, that works really great with Max. I know with a lot of the kids. Um, so a couple of weeks leading up to their first session with um, Love Serving Autism, you know, every day perhaps the, the parents can sit down and go over the social story about tennis and playing tennis, learning tennis. I love that idea. We, we have it on our website, but the parents, like we have a PDF and a video <laughs> and, oh, and yeah. parent, parents aren't really utilizing it. I, I, I tend to just, every time I see someone register, I send it to them because they're not going to the site to find it. But you know, you can you only can give so them a much. hard copy. Like you take away, like having to log okay. on, okay. printing it out themselves at home. So you I like do that all idea. that. <gasps> I mean, and you're right, it's it's accessible, but if you just like hand it to them in their hand when they sign up, or if there's a way to do that, then um, it eliminates the parent having an excuse or reason to not do that. Cause it's really, you know, I think the social stories are the best, yeah. And maybe we give one to the child too. I mean, like, cause they'll say, I lost it. I mean, I'm not trying to over, but then they have something that is their own, kind of almost like, um, 
like a golden ticket, you know what I mean? Like the Willy Wonka, like their golden ticket to tennis. And it has, um, you know, the fun stuff, on, but, the, but the the learning is on there too. So I love the visual reminder and like kind of building up. Cause you know, part of this is like learning how to transition. I mean, we're transitioning everybody. And I think hard something, it's texture, it's in your hands. I think that's that's excellent. And then it's, it's active learning. It's not just we're pushing it to them. It creates another opportunity for families and their children to engage. And then, you know, so then that child can or easily transition because I'm sure like their family can be their safe unit. And now we're wanting them to do something that's, you know, outside of that. I have an idea for you guys. You guys are so like great. Like your ideas are phenomenal. Have you thought about taking parents that are already seasoned and pairing them with new parents and having like, like maybe like parent mentor buddy system, buddy system yeah. where it's like, Hey, you know, mm. My child is really anxious it's three days before the session. Or even like having experienced parents like call the new parents, just welcoming wel welcoming them, them into the whole entire community. Hey, if you have any experience, feel free to reach out to me. I can find resources for you, or if I don't have the answer, but like letting them know they're not by themselves, they're not alone. That's a great idea. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. I know it's um I know it's eight o'clock, but I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I, um, does anyone else have, I know Laura, I know we're going to continue to work together and we're so excited and, and, um, wow. Path to Potential is an incredible company. I'm so thankful mm -hmm. we connected, uh, especially yeah. whether we're in New York, Florida, Pennsylvania, like, I think there's a way, you know, to Im like implement all of this, um, as Laura said, you know, to give the families the tools and supports to know that their, their child can try it's errorless, even if they've never played tennis before. They don't know how, because I do get emails like that. I have no idea how my child's going to react or respond. They don't even register. They just bring him just to see if he'll even participate. So I think that's a great idea. And, um, you know, we can continue to create those resources together, hopefully. And I'm going to, we're recording this. So we're going to go and I'm going to create a YouTube so I can share it with the coaches and, and hopefully uh, they can listen to it and maybe schedule an additional you know, really train the coaches on this because I think it's important. I mean, Kyle's an on-court coach. That's what he does full time. And, and I know he, he talks about, even though it's not ABA, he talks about a lot of these strategies he uses in the junior program. He doesn't work with special needs, but you know, he does implement this, right, Kyle? <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah, and I, uh... I, I, I work in the private sector, uh, private high end country club. And, uh, a lot of these ABA therapy techniques, we, it's very similar to teaching tennis. It's the stop, show, and go. It's all of those things that I'm, I'm pretty familiar with. We just have different tennis names for them, but it's all good. Th thank you. That makes us so happy. That makes us so happy. Thank you. And I just started following Path to Potential and the video that came up this morning. I mean, that's what we want to get out as LSA. But, but just watch it. Oh my gosh, I get choked up. I'm sure everybody, how could you not have hope? The video of the child being able to say their name for the first time. And you just honestly see the reactions of the family, like you were saying, you know, and who knows, probably from there, they went from, ma, ma, you know what I mean? Like we saw the end, you know, like the gold medal round versus, you know, and, um, you know, families like can connect with that. So, but amazing work. I, I love that you got, you know, what you guys are doing and helping us even furthermore, because we're giving opportunity to everybody and opportunity should be for everybody. So thank you. Yeah.